Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God, our Father. I want to say good morning to the Potter's House and to all the saints who are gathering from around the world uh, to view this broadcast. I believe that God has given me a word that will bless your life, stir your spirit, and challenge the way you think. Uh, I'm excited to be with you this morning. I'm excited that you have logged in from wherever you are to have this virtual experience. And though it is, in fact, a virtual experience, that does not diminish the fact that it can be virtual and still be spiritual. It can be virtual and still be anointed. It can be virtual and still be effective. So prepare your hearts and prepare your minds as we prepare to go into the Word of God. And more importantly, that the Word of God might go into us because these are the kinds of times that we need the Word of God to go into us. We need his word to saturate our spirits. I'm going to Matthew 21, 1 through 10, so you can get ahead of me. We need, we need the word of God to get deep down in our souls and in our spirits and speak to us in such a supernatural way that we don't leave the way we came. And in perilous times and times of uncertainty, now more than ever, we need to consider and contemplate not only the word of God, but our understanding of God's word. The, that understanding being the truth we stand under. How, how does this become applicable in my daily life? For me, it does no good to have, to embrace the historicity of the text and not have any contemporary relevance with what's going on in our lives today. And right now, everything in the world is going on in our lives. So let's go to the Word of God. We're going to be in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 21, verse 1 through 10. And it reads, and they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs him and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? I want to take this text and I want to use the subject, the shock of suffering. Yeah. The shock of suffering. Can you say amen? amen? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us as we go into the word of God today, that it might be illuminated in our spirits, that it might be indelibly etched into our hearts and minds, that we might be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might be shaped into the very image of Christ in the earth. Now, like never before, we need to be Christ in the earth, the salt of the earth, a city set up on a hill that cannot be hid and cause our faith to shine out even beyond our fears and even beyond our anxieties and even beyond our complexities and even beyond our uncertainties, allow our faith to shine out and saturate us, endow us with power. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody who believes in his word, shout amen. amen. You may be seated. I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk to you because of the perils of the times that we're living in. I believe the word of God is more relevant right now than ever before. Yes. We need his word to guide us through the turbulence that we're in right now. And really it's a test of our faith because I didn't say that we need our fellowship to guide us. Our fellowship is important. Fellowship is biblical. Fellowship is right. Fellowship is something that we were made to have. God said it's not good for man to be alone. I get that. Yes. But this is not a test of our ability to interact with each other. This is a test of how deeply are we rooted and grounded in God's word 
For the word of God is what sustains us when the test is on. And it occurs to me, it's a little bit amazing that the, there's not been much focus in recent days on the whole Lent season. Very little focus, very little being said about it, very little being talked about because I think we are so preoccupied with the uncertainty of how we might end up suffering. <laughs> that we fail to recognize that the God we serve becomes emblematic of suffering itself. And I, I must confess to you, I don't, I don't always enjoy preaching uh, this particular message from this particular text on Palm Sunday only because it is so traditional and I've been doing it for 43 years that sometimes I'd rather preach something else rather than to preach the very predictable. Yes, Nevertheless, when I looked at this text, I'm not just preaching it because it is in fact Palm Sunday, but I'm preaching it because I looked at the text again through the lens of what we're going through right now. I found it very, 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 very fascinating uh, when I began to look at the text and I'm looking at the text at a time that all around the world believers are going through various levels of suffering. Some are suffering on respirators. Some are suffering with the uncertainty of having loved ones on respirators and waiting to hear updates from doctors who are overladen with more patients than they can handle not enough equipment to maintain in some areas, not enough beds to accommodate the victims, nurses working sick and everybody struggling, trying to make the unworkable begin to work and they are suffering. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In the midst of that suffering, uh, I've been inundated with calls from pastors and leaders and friends with various predicaments and, and easing, trying to ease their anxiety and handle my own. And then to understand that a lot of people were simply just claustrophobic because in certain regions of our country, we have been shut in the house and we have not been allowed to go out or not only to go certain places or only under certain circumstances. We're not used to being in the house that long. And we say, we are suffering. And I question in my own mind, though I realize that there is a certain amount of suffering involved in, in not being able to go do what you want to do. I wonder in the third world countries where there are various levels of engagement, if they would think we were suffering. I wonder if they would think that we were suffering shut up in our air conditioned houses and central heat in our houses and carpet on the floor and uh, our built in kitchens and our dishwashers and our, our television with our 300 channels. I wonder if they would feel bad for us. You begin to understand then that suffering is relative and suffering depends on what you're going through. I'm wondering if the AIDS patients in the AIDS ward would think that we were suffering just because we didn't get to make the hookup with our friends and hang out in our favorite restaurant and go to our favorite theater or go to our favorite church to worship. I wonder when we stand before God in the face of the apostles who were sawed asunder and crucified upside down and some of them were beheaded, I wonder if they would accept our definition of suffering in the context of what they went through. If we stand up there with Paul and all of them and, and Peter and James and John and they all start talking about how they were beaten and how they were stoned and how they were crucified and we get up and say, yeah, I was shut up in my house for weeks. I wonder how that uh, really define suffering. Recently I did an interview and whenever you go out there and you start doing interviews at times of crisis, one of the most predictable questions that you uh, will most often get is how could God be good and allow such suffering? I, I want to say to you this morning as a Christian, one of the things I love about being a Christian is that being a Christian means that God does not hide suffering from the conversation he's having with us about faith. Yes, sir. Now I must confess that we preachers sometimes hide it. We don't talk about it like we should. We don't preach about it like we should. Sometimes we don't even have a good theology around suffering itself because suffering isn't exciting. It doesn't make people want to come today. It doesn't get them motivated. Nobody wants to come. But we don't do as good a job as Jesus did because Jesus did not hide suffering from his followers. Yes, sir. In fact, when he made his appeal for them to follow him, the criteria of his invitation was take up your cross and follow me. 
Now, because we see the cross as an emblem of worship, we really don't get it that at the time Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, crosses were not seen as an emblem of worship, but rather a torture mechanism for a convicted criminal. Yes, it would be like, take up your electric chair and follow me. Take up your gas chamber and follow me. There is no spiritual connotation to take up your cross yet. So when Jesus starts talking to them about taking up your cross, it's not taking up a pretty thing. Yeah. It's taking up a cursed thing, a, 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 a emblem of suffering and, and agony and, and guilt and, 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 and an emblem of degradation and, and social disruption and, and, and judicial discord. A cross was not something that people shouted about. They did not understand it in that context. They struggled to understand Jesus anyway, because when you look at this particular week, they, they understood it better in retrospect than they did in real time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This week starts out with a triumphant cacophony of believers coming around to celebrate uh, Jesus. They have come with their palms in their hands and their coats out and they're singing Hosanna. It's interesting because it is the triumphant entry to a terrifying week. Yes, yes, and, uh, that is to say that it starts out in such uh, pageantry and, yes. and enthusiasm and excitement and positivity, but it doesn't stay that way. By the end of the week, there's an arc to the story that is so sharp and so profound that from the way it starts, the, the ending is unpredictable yes. as we read about the beginning. The beginning is laced with the pageantry of, of elegant worship in, in almost like a parade, a crescendo. Jesus has become quite popular, so popular that he has upset Caiaphas, the priests, and all of the priests and those in the synagogue are now seeking to kill him because they said he's about to take the whole world. Yes, sir. So it, it, there's no question that Jesus had impact. In another text, you will understand that he has just raised Lazarus from the dead. He has caused so much excitement and enthusiasm to break out around him that they're afraid that he is going to shift the support from the synagogue over to this new ideology that Christ comes to bring. So on one hand, you've got all of these people. The Bible says a great multitude has come to celebrate him. And Jesus has requested that they bring a donkey in and they bring a colt in and that he's going to ride it into Jerusalem to fulfill scripture. And they're basically having a worship service, amazing pageantry of worship and praise and singing and celebrating the goodness of God and it starts out with that kind of power. It is amazing that the week starts out with such power yeah. and ends in such pain. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have a, a, a tendency as preachers and as Christians to pick and choose the parts of the Bible that we like to talk about. So it's more exciting to talk about Hosanna yes, than it is to talk about crucify him. Yes, we see more emphasis placed on Hosanna we will mention the crucifixion, but only in the context of how he saved me from my sins. We don't mention the crucifixion in terms of his agony because at the beginning of the week, he is so exciting that everybody wants to follow him. By the end of the week, Isaiah has said, there is no beauty about him that we should desire him. They have beat him so bad that nobody wants to look at him, but it doesn't start out that way. It's amazing to me that we have not focused on this season because we are so shocked ourselves. And I, I, I want to talk about this whole shock thing, the whole shock of suffering. We're shocked ourselves that we could be at the pinnacle of success in the stock market and business is going up and jobs going up everywhere. People buying homes and everything going wonderful. And all of a sudden, through this virus, all of a sudden we've been shocked. Bishop. Stock market starts crashing. Job markets start crashing. People start losing their jobs and starting to face uncertainty. And the shock of suffering has become so agonizing that we've had to labor to hold on to our churches, to hold on to our jobs, to hold on to our minds, to hold on to our sanity because the shock of suffering 
the shock of suffering. It should not shock Christians seeing as the whole emblem of our faith brings suffering out of the shadows and puts it center stage. It shouldn't shock Christians that we have a God who spared not his own son. We should not grapple with the question that the world does. How could a good God allow bad things to happen to me? Not when he spared not his own son. That if he spared not his only begotten son, then I know that he will not spare me. All the more will I do a chastisement to validate the fact that I am a son and a legitimate heir of salvation. For whom the Lord loveth, the Bible said, he chasteneth. When we start looking at this kind of thing and we start grappling with suffering, I was amazed at the people who were talking about the celebrities that were doing posts in confinement and down in the comments and people were talking about, oh, they're just like us. They're going, and they seem to draw some comfort from the fact that these people who ride in big cars and live in nice homes are now confined just as, as they were. And they said there's some solidarity because no matter whether you're rich or you're famous or you have notoriety or you have political power or you're the CEO of a Fortune 100 company, we're all going through the same thing. And there was some fellowship in the suffering. And I laughed at their comments. I didn't respond. I stayed out of the fray of, of the discussion, but I laughed at their comments because they almost seemed to find some vindication in the fact that these people who seem to have these ideal lives were now confined to a place of suffering because as my mother taught me, misery in love's company. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. Misery loves company. But the reason I thought it was funny is we didn't need a coronavirus to share suffering. Suffering exists in the life of everybody. Black or white or brown, suffering does not discriminate by the color of your skin or the class or the height of your notoriety. Suffering will make its way right into the house of a mansion as well as it will the, somebody sleeping up under a bridge. No one escapes suffering. Just because they're not suffering in the way that you're suffering doesn't mean that they're not suffering at all. Beautiful people suffer. Rich people suffer, poor people suffer, third world countries suffer, first world countries, nobody escapes suffering. You may be high, you may be low, you may be rich, you may be poor, but when the Lord, God gets ready, everybody's got to move. And yet there seems to be some mystery around suffering as if some people suffer and some people don't. We may not suffer from the same things, but God is too just to allow anyone to escape suffering, not even Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, we find Jesus in this moment of great adulation and celebration, and they're waving their palm trees. I remember being a little boy, they used to take little palms and make crosses out of them and pin it on us on Palm Sunday, and that was my first understanding of Palm Sunday. The church would be decorated with palm leaves all around to celebrate Palm Sunday, and all oh, the choir would sing, and the pageantry, and all the beauty, and all the things that, that right now we're missing. We don't have that kind of celebration right now because our faith is being tested, because our commitment is being tested, because the word of God that we have heard and often taken for granted has become scarce enough that now it's become a priority. And oddly enough, the people who didn't always come to church when they could now are complaining about not being able to come to church and our faith is being, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. Our, our faith is being challenged. Our faith is being challenged to the core because suffering now seems strange to us. Yes, suffering now becomes a question that I have to respond to in the press because of the, 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 the complexity of how could God be good yeah. and allow suffering. Yeah. No one escapes suffering. In fact, the Bible says that he is a present help in the time of trouble. And so what I want to suggest to you that, that the crowd is around him in the celebration, but they leave before the suffering. 
<laughs> yeah. They're, they're singing in the celebration. They're rejoicing in the celebration, but they leave before the suffering begins. And I want to submit to you for your consideration that Jesus is more powerful in his suffering than he is in his celebration. And if we are really like Jesus, that means that there is a power that we exude in suffering that we do not experience in celebration. And though Job said, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. There's some kind of anointing that comes out of you when you have pressure applied that you would not experience any other way. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And so let us not allow the, the, the oddity in the, in the Western world of seeing a man riding on a donkey covered by coats and palm branches laid mixed with coats all on the ground. Let us not be so distracted by these elements that we do not notice the fact that the crowd does not stay. I said the crowd does not stay. I wondered in my mind, where, where is the singing at the end of the week when he really needed to be worshipped, when he really needed their support? I wondered where were the worshipers and the dancers and the celebration and the crescendo of glory in the moment of his real hour of suffering when he could have used a few hosannas. He could have used somebody reminding him, you may be on a cross, but you're still my king. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Oh, that's what faith is. Who can look beyond the cross and still see the king? I wondered what happened to the crowd that in just one week, the crowd would dissipate. The apostles would step back from their positions and, and one would start cussing and one would start doubting and one would betray him. By the end of just one week, yes, sir. we see Christ starting the week in celebration and ending the week in a place of suffering. Now, I want to be honest. I don't like suffering. I don't want to suffer. I prefer not to suffer. There's never been a morning I woke up and said, I hope this is a suffering day. I, I want to be honest about it. I haven't seen a new year yet and say, this is my year to suffer. Hallelujah. No, I don't ask for it, but God still orders us to go through periods of suffering. Up until now in this country, we've enjoyed the luxury of looking out of the sanctity of our democracy through the window at other countries and talk about those people are dealing with a plague and those people are dealing with a disease and look at them. They have a virus and all. Oh, let's pray for this country and that country, never thinking that the viruses would cross the waters and fly across on planes. And now we have become them and they. Be careful how you handle other people in the moment of their suffering and look in a condescending way at them because what I'm suffering today, oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. What I'm suffering today, you can be suffering tomorrow. It's my daughter today, but it'll be yours tomorrow. Be careful how you handle my boy because you got a son coming up. And suffering will come to your house. And the real test is, I don't need to be tested in my moment of celebration. I need to be tested in the moment of my suffering. How committed am I when the crowd is gone? How committed am I when the storms begin to rage? How committed am I in the moment of adversity? I'm so grateful to God while I appreciate all the things he's done for me. And I, I am so blessed to come and stand in this church and see people all the way up to the top balcony and see them praising and magnifying God. But I want the devil to know that I'm not serving God for the crowd. That if I have to stand back in a building like I did years ago and preach to four or five people that God is still good. Yes, he is. Oh, I said he's still good. Yes, he is. If 
If he thinks for one minute that I'll lose my anointing when I lose my crowd, he didn't understand where I came from. I've been through too much to get here and lose my anointing over people. People didn't give it to me. And people, oh, they can't take it away. They can't take it away. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Glory to God. This be a moment normally I'd say touch your neighbor and say they can't take it away. But maybe you got to touch yourself and remind yourself they can't take it away. If they didn't give it, a shot. If they didn't give it, then they can't. They can't take it away. There have been moments in all of our lives of suffering where we suffered in isolation. We suffered without anybody knowing that we were suffering. We stayed up at night all night long and put on a happy face and faked it the next day and nobody knew that you were going through a personal crisis. There is not a person in this room or watching online or sitting on a couch or holding an iPad or looking at your phone right now who hadn't gone through personal moments of great tragedy, great adversity. Pressure pressing down on you until sleep evades you, until food won't digest, until rashes break out on your body. Somebody knows what I'm talking about to go through personal suffering. And yet there is now amongst us some fraternity in our suffering. There is some fellowship in our suffering. It's nice to know that I can pick up the phone and call somebody who's going through what I'm going through right now. Yeah, I just get some kind of comfort out of knowing that I don't have to explain to you what I'm going through because we are suffering in the same. The fellowship of suffering brought me to Paul saying, oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering. But here we find the apostle asking God, I want to meet you in the fellowship of your suffering. I'm not the kind of Christian that's going to say Hosanna on Monday and then run from you by Thursday. I want to know all of you, all that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. I want to talk to you this morning about a God who will meet you in suffering, who will meet you in a crisis, who will meet you at a cemetery, (laughs) who will meet you in a storm. I want to talk to you about a God that will go in a hospital room and meet you in your dying hour. I want to talk to you about a God who will wipe the tears away from your eyes. I want to talk to you about a God who can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. I want to talk to you about a God who will hold your mind together when your marriage is falling apart. I want to talk to you about a God that will keep you from collapsing even though you're going through a personal crisis. I want to talk about a Christ that will show up in a crisis. (laughs) I need Christ in my crisis. I need him in my crisis more than I do in my moment of exaltation. I need him in my frustration. I need him in my agony. I need him in my uncertainty. I need him in my confusion. And, And I need to know, as Peter asked, I need to know that God cares when the storm is raging. I need to know that God cares when the lightning is flashing. I I need to know that God cares when I can't go about life as normal. I need to know that God cares when I'm sitting in a waiting room at an ICU unit waiting for words and waiting for an answer. I need to know that God cares when I've lost my job. I need to know that God cares when my wife has walked away. I need to know that God cares when my husband has left. I need to know that God cares when I don't know how I'm gonna feed these kids next week. And I earned the right, by the way, to preach this message. Just because you met me at this stage of the week does not mean that I have not had other stages of the week. I know what it is to preach victory and come home to a house with no lights. I know what it is to talk about God being a provider and then I have to believe him to get the water turned back on. I know what I'm talking about. I earned the right to preach this message. I know what it is to swallow my feelings and preach over my mother's casket. I know what it is to endure a Affliction and still be faithful. Yes. I have the right. Come on. Yes, sir. 
I earn the right because I have had fellowship with him in suffering. It hasn't just been success. I have known him through tears. I have known him through agony. I have preached in this very church with my body right with pain and pain running up and down my legs and just coming out of surgery. I have stood here and pre I, know, I have known him in suffering and I am a witness that he will not forsake you. <laughs> I got to speak up for him. I can't let you just talk about him. I can't let you just blog about him. I can't let you just get out there and say just anything about him. He will meet you in suffering. He will meet you when mama won't meet you, when, when daddy won't meet you, when sisters and friends won't meet you, when your prayer partners won't meet you. God will show up. Oh, hallelujah. Is there anybody that can testify that he's not a fair weather friend, but he'll stick by you in the storm? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The crowd that sings today will leave tomorrow. They'll wave their branches in your face so much you can't see the road, and they'll forsake you before the week is out. The crowd that shouts, surely you're the king, will doubt you before the week is out. Be careful how you sign up when everybody throwing rocks at somebody else because the same people who are throwing rocks at him are just waiting on you and they'll turn on you and throw rocks yes, sir. Yes, sir. at you. But when they all try to rock you, yes, sir. God will still be with you. Stephen told me they were stoning him and he was looking up and Jesus was standing up on the right hand of the majesty on high, giving him a standing ovation. Wow! 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 He was being stoned. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Oh my God, I feel, I feel my help in here this morning. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying, that God will stand up for you when men sit down on you in the hour of your agony. And in case you're going through something, whether it's a virus or something else, the fact everybody watching is going through something, I want to tell you about a God who will stand by you when you're suffering. I was reading about a, 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 a German uh, philosopher, his name is Jorgen Moltmann. And this, this young man is now a theologian and a scholar, but early in his life he was drafted into the military, the, the Nazi military of Germany. And in World War II, Jorgen fought uh, with the German Nazis. He came in and was drafted at 16, but by 19, he had come up under attack in his aircraft and had been captured a prisoner of war. Wow. Now you must understand this is in the adolescence of his life when you are still developing as a human being and he has to develop in gunfire in pain, in agony, in falling planes, and smoke, and blood, and agony. And he has now been captured by some European soldiers. And they have drug him away as a prisoner of war. And he does not yet know God. And he wonders if there were such a thing as a God, how could he let me go through this? So Jorgen is now a prisoner of war and he's been captured and while he has been captured, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, he was, he was held in Scotland or somewhere like that in captivity and treated like any prisoner of war at 18, 19 years old, suffering agony and abuse and mistreatment so much that he despaired of life itself. And an American uh, gentleman who was working in the prison slipped him a Bible and he started reading about our God just because you got nothing else to do. And he stumbled up on the Gospel of St. Mark and started reading about Christ being crucified. And he read the lines, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabbathani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it was on the premise of Christ's suffering that Jorgen has an encounter with God. He said, I can serve a God like this. 
because he feels like I feel. He's, he's going through what I'm going through. I can serve him because I connect with the fact that there are moments of uncertainty that make you feel for say, why? Why hast thou forsaken me? I want to preach. I want to preach to some people who have gone through some Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabathany moments. And all of a sudden you, you find koinonia, you find fellowship with God in suffering that you connect with the agony of the cross. I would to God that I had time or even the ability to articulate effectively the agony of the cross. I don't know whether the real agony was the, the spiritual agony that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Yes, that he became what he hated. Yes, oh. yes, that he became what he despised. Oh my God. Oh, I could stay there a little while and talk to some people who have become what you hated. <laughs> Uh, who have done things that you said you despise. But, but I, don't, I don't know whether it was the agony of a holy God becoming the emblem of sin and shame and being smitten of his father. I don't know whether to talk about the agony of being smitten of his father or whether I should talk about the agony of him being beaten by creatures he created. Bishop. That they beat him with a cat of nine tails until they ripped his flesh wide open. And, and history says his entrails were hanging outside. I don't, I don't know whether to talk about that part of it. I don't want to talk about the, dis, the disgrace of being stripped in front of your followers and being standing there naked, covered in nothing but blood. I don't know whether to talk about that. I don't know whether to talk about the part that they drove nails into his hands and, and nails into his feet and put a crown of thorns on him and snatched his beard. Have you ever had somebody pull a hair out, snatched his beard out of his face? And he's bleeding from everywhere. He's bleeding from everywhere. And there in the moment of his greatest suffering, we see the greatest encounter he has with God. That Jesus says more in power in his suffering than he did in his celebration. This, this, this was what captured Jorgen Moltmann and blew his mind in such a way that Jorgen says, I connect with him because he is one with me in suffering. That I cannot promise you that God will not allow us to go through suffering. I cannot definitively say that he will always snatch us out of suffering. We like to preach that. But there are some times that God allows you to go through suffering that you might have an encounter with him through suffering that you could not have any other way. I know the best way to close a message is to tell you how he's going to bring you out. But the, real, the reality is sometimes he takes you through. <laughs> he doesn't always bring you out. Every now and then, he takes you through. But I heard him say, when you pass through the water, I'll be with you. When you go through the flood, I'll be there. If they throw you in the fire, good God Almighty, I'll be right there in the fire with you because I am a God that does not run away when you suffer. Yes, I am a God who will not try to escape your pain. And he has been flamboyant in his discussion about being Jehovah Shama, being present with us in our suffering. Somebody said to me, it must be hard on you. Shut up in the house by yourself. I said, I've never been by myself. Yes, sir. Shut me up anywhere you want to shut me up. Yes, but you can never leave me by myself. Yes, For I had him say, Lo, I am with you always. They'll be with you sometimes, but I'll be with you always. Hallelujah. Paul tells Timothy, when my hour came to trial, no man stood with me. Notwithstanding, God stood with me. That's what he tells Timothy. He stood with me when others forsook me. And I want to talk to you about the shock of suffering that maybe we need to adjust our theology. Maybe we have taught enough on five steps to be blessed. And, 
and I got the blessing of Abraham. Nothing wrong with that stuff, but maybe we've done enough teaching on being overcomers and then champions and walking in victory. Maybe we've done enough preaching about how God will snatch you out. Maybe we need to change our theology and adjust it to the point that we embrace a God who walks through it with you. Our God, hallelujah, who goes through the fire with you who goes into pain with you, who goes into suffering with you. I couldn't understand as a young preacher. I said, God, how can you use me to heal other people? Literally lay hands and see them heal and then bring me home to a mother with Alzheimer's. How could I be so anointed? I remember leaving the church who still wet with sweat from preaching and going in the hospital and laying across her body with a sweaty body and laid on her and asked him to heal her and still she died. And the enemy said, what you gonna preach now? I'm talking about seeing God in suffering, walking you through the pain. And the enemy said, you, 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 you couldn't even heal your own mother. And how can you stand up in front of them and preach now? I said, not only will I preach now, I'll preach your funeral. I'll stand over top of her. And I couldn't do it in my own strength, but I met him in the suffering. So I want to talk to you about this whole shock we have about suffering is not a result of our God. It's a result of our teaching. <laughs> we have not been taught enough about suffering. See, back when I came along, my grandmother's generation came out of the Great Depression and all the songs were about suffering. <laughs> I'm going through, I'm going through. I'll take the way with the Lord's despised few. I started in Jesus and I'm going through. Ain't nobody singing about suffering. No more. When the depression was over, the revelation of suffering seemed to dissipate out of our hymn books. Wow. <laughs> and so, if you want to sing a song about suffering, you have to go back about 40 years because our revelation is seen through the lens of our situation. <laughs> So, the way we see God is a reflection of our point of view. <laughs> when things are going good, we see him in the Hosanna lens. <laughs> oh, but when things go bad, can you still see him in the crucify him lens? Sooner or later, if you live long enough, you're going to have both extremes. You're going to have the dichotomous experience of being victorious over here and agonized over here, of being whole in this area and being broken in there. If you, if you live long enough, yes, yeah. Yeah. you begin to walk away with certain conclusions like Jorgen did, that, that, that I can serve a God like this because I found him in my suffering. I know it's not a seductive invitation. I know it's not as dramatic and or as pleasant as this world would like to have, that it's hard to get people to come to Jesus now. So we promise you Cadillacs and Mercedes and Rolls Royces, come to Jesus and God's gonna give you a bigger house. Come to Jesus and he's gonna bring your children out of prison. Come to Jesus and he's gonna, we're quick to make promises. It's easy to write checks on somebody else's account. Come on here. As long as you're writing on somebody else's account, anybody can write you a big check when it comes out of somebody else's account. But walking with God cannot just be a bunch of quick preachers with slick hair saying nice things to excite big crowds. Sooner or later, you're going to have a week like this. Sooner or later, if you live long enough, the, the, the pageantry of your wedding will go through the pain of marriage. <laughs> if you live long enough, the, the luxury of holding a little beautiful baby in your arms that starts out in your arms ends up on your heart. Yeah, if, you, if you live long enough, you're going to have a week like this. And I came to warn you, don't let the hosannas fool you. <laughs> I cannot promise you that everybody who starts with you is going to stay with you. 
I cannot promise you that everybody who celebrates you will be there when things turn bad for you. But I know a God who's got all power in his hand. He sits high, but he looks real low. And when they throw you in the fire, he'll get in the fire with you. When they throw you in the furnace, he'll be walking around in the furnace with you. He'll stand right there by you because there is something, there's some kinetic energy, there's some connectivity, there's some kinship, there's some kinship that we have with him in the agony and the suffering of life. So don't be shocked when suffering comes. Set your face as flint because we are not serving a God or a faith that is built on just promises of good time. He didn't just give you sunshine and not tell you about rain. He didn't just give you pleasure and not be open about pain. The epitome, every time you see a cross, I want you to see that God is, how do young people say, keeping it real. He's keeping it 100 that you're gonna suffer. So don't be shocked in the suffering. There is a revelation to be seen in the suffering. I thought to myself, he had the biggest crowd at the most insignificant moment. And all that left him before the suffering missed his finest hour. For his finest hour is not when we lay down our coats and we lay down our palm leaves. His finest hour is when they strip back his flesh and he commends his body over to his father and says, I've done all I can do. And they hold him down for the count and say, he will not be back. And for three days, it looked like he was a liar. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. For three days, you could think anything you wanted to think. For three days, you could say anything you wanted to say about it. For three days, you could say, see, he was a phony and a fraud. For three days, you could throw your hands up and say there's nothing to him. Friday, you could laugh. Saturday, you could laugh. But early, early Sunday morning, he slapped the smile off your face. Yes, he took the grin out of your teeth. Jeez. Early Sunday morning with no witnesses and no crowd and no palm trees and nobody singing not one song. Nobody saying Hosanna anywhere. Early Sunday morning without anybody to help him out of his grave clothes. Without anybody to get him out of the tomb. Early God all by himself. Said it's over. Step from death into life. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Step from hell and death into life itself. Showing I have overcome and said you can overcome too. Now in order to be an overcomer, you gotta have something to come over. As I close, oh y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You can't be an overcomer and not have something to come over. Hallelujah to God. You can't be a champion and you ain't been in a fight. You can't be victorious if you don't have an opponent. If you don't have an opponent, you don't have a victory. Oh! But I'm here to tell I feel like preaching, y'all. I'm here to tell you. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you and you and you. I'm here to tell all of you that are watching online. But most of all, I'm here to tell the enemy. I want to tell the devil, I want to preach to the devil for a minute. If you think I'm shocked, you don't know me. <laughs> if you think I'm all quit, you underestimated me. Think it not strange that these fiery trials have come against you. Hallelujah! I have a God that'll meet you in the fire, that'll meet you in the furnace, that'll meet you in the hospital, that'll meet you in your agony, that'll meet you in your suffering, that'll meet you in the hospital, that'll meet you in the cemetery, that'll meet you in your pain, that'll meet you with boils all over you, meet you with leprosy. I have a God that'll meet you in the unemployment line. I have a God that'll meet you when they threw you out, evicted you put you away, said you'll never be back. I am 
a God that'll meet you in the homeless shelter. I have a God that'll meet you at the divorce court. I have a God. Oh, shut up. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Is that close? I feel glory in this place. The anointing of the Lord is here. As I close this message, I want you to understand, you don't have to be shocked. You have to be prepared. The thing that stood out the most to me in this text is that though they were saying Hosanna, they failed to understand that he could not restore Jerusalem and be the king they expected him to be until he was on the cross they didn't expect. And anytime something hits you that you didn't see coming, anytime you started out the week talking about the crown and ended up the week laying on the cross, don't be shocked in your suffering. Now I know COVID-19 has taken the headlines. The coronavirus has taken up all the news. It has overshadowed the discussion of the crucifixion. <laughs> it's making all the headlines. That's all anybody wants to talk about. Even church folk have forgotten that we were in a Lent season because they're so busy worried about, do I have my mask on right? Am I six feet away from you? Am I, am I washing my hands long enough? And I'm not making fun of all of that. We need to do all of that and wash anything else you got to wash to stay alive. I'm not against any of that. But don't let Corona steal the headlines from Christ. Because if there's anything greater than Corona, <laughs> it's Christ. <laughs> if there's anything that's stronger than Corona. It is the Christ of God. If there's anything that's a cure to the virus, it's the victorious one, the blood of the Lamb. Oh, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I heard the Bible say, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so my brothers and sisters, as I close this message today, I want to dismiss shock out of your spirit, dismay out of your heart, and in the midst of your suffering, not after it's over, in the midst of whatever you're suffering, to whatever degree you're suffering, I want you to feel for him. I want you to look for him. You're going to look for him beaten and bruised, locked up in a prison. Yes, a young man on the verge of suicide. He reached out and he touched the suffering savior and said he suffered so he understands what it's like to be me. Our God does not flee from your pain. He does not evacuate the house in the middle of your loneliness. If your test came back positive, he won't back away from you. <laughs> he won't even put on a suit to cover himself to be in the room with you. If other people are scared of you, he is not scared of you. If you're going through some other agony today, we have a God who doesn't start a week that he doesn't finish. He's just Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes, the senior pastor of the Potter's House, and I'm gonna pastor this church as long as God gives me strength in my body. If I have to do it through cyberspace, then I'll do it through cyberspace. Until we get together face to face, I'm gonna preach this gospel the unadulterated word of the Lord. The Bible told me to do it in season and out of season and reprove and rebuke with all long suffering. 
the book said the time will come that men will not endure sound doctrine. Heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. Just want to hear something to make you feel good. But life will take you through things that do not feel good. But they work together for the good of them that are the called according to the purpose of God. And so as I close this message to all of you that are perhaps suffering in a multiplicity of ways and to those of you who are suffering in ways that are not detectable to others because on the outside your stuff looks good, your lawn is manicured, <laughs> you, you have no weeds, flowers are growing, house is painted, but somewhere on the inside of that house you deal with things that, are, that feel to the soul like corona, that make you feel like, I can't breathe. But I'm telling you, you can. I'm telling you, you can still breathe. I'm telling you, you can still live. I'm telling you, you can remain connected if you lose this Pollyanna Eastern world Santa Claus understanding of Christianity and know that every question in life does not have an easy answer. Every story will not have a happy ending. Everybody doesn't walk away healed in the end. Some people like Mephibosheth hop the whole rest of their life. Some people like Jacob limp all the way the rest of their life never experiencing the miraculous power of the God that they serve. And yet he's God in your lip. He's God in your pain. He's God in your suffering. He's God in your singleness. He's God in your loneliness. He's God in, he's God in your unhappy marriedness. He's God in your wheelchair. He's God in your positive report. He's God in your negative report. He's God in your bills. He's God over your pain. He's God over your family. This is the God that we offer to you. Yes, sir. A God that does not flee the scene of the crime. A God that sticks closer than a brother. And if you ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. I've got some people watching me that don't even normally listen at no preacher, they don't even turn this on on Sunday. But pressure has pushed you to a point that you're reaching outside of yourself and reach, 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 reach just like Jorgen Moltmann did until you touch the cross, touch his bleeding hand, touch his bleeding hand and know that he knows what pain feels like and he will be with you and strengthen you and sometimes he will deliver you from it but if he doesn't deliver you from it he'll grace you to go through it this is the God I want to share with you today that sticks closer than a brother if you do not know him in the free pardon of your sins I want to challenge you to come to know him today. You can't build no house on sand because sand is not stable and emotions are not stable. And if you build your house on sand, when the storm comes, it's gonna come down. Feelings will move. Today I'm happy, tomorrow I'm not. You cannot build your faith on feelings and circumstances. I know there is a God because he gave me a husband. I know there is a God because I got the mortgage approved. No, 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 no. I know there is a God if there is no house. I know there is a God if my spouse leaves me. I know there is a God if I'm shut up in a hospital. Ah, because my faith is not built on my circumstances. If your faith is built on your circumstances, all the enemy has to do to kill your faith is attack your circumstances. Yeah. You gotta build your faith on the integrity of God's word.